Hello, my name is Paul Brody. I'm the America's Technology Sector Strategy Leader for Ernst & Young, and I'd like to talk to you today about Bitcoin and the blockchain. Uh, to me, these are really amazing technologies. I've been working with the blockchain for more than two years now, and during that time, uh, I've come to a, a great, have a great appreciation for how I believe this is not just important for financial services, I think this is important as a revolutionary technology for uh, IT overall. What I'd like to do today is share with you a copy of a presentation I made for uh, the client base of Goldman Sachs, which I gave earlier this month, and it really talks about what the blockchain does and why it is so special, starting with how Bitcoin works and then talking about its applications of the blockchain technology more generally. So let's start with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, what I like to say is that Bitcoin, which is the first creation of the blockchain technologies, is in many ways not revolutionary at all. What it does is nothing special, but how it does it is in fact special, important, and in effect really revolutionary. So let's start with what it is that uh, Bitcoin does. Bitcoin is what I like to call the reinvention of the most basic workload in modern computing, transaction processing. So uh, Bitcoin is designed as a currency in a bank, right? But every time you move money, every time you make a payment, that's a transaction. Well, on Facebook, every time you click on like, that is a transaction. On Twitter, every time you tweet, that's a transaction. Every plane ticket, every electricity meter, meter reading, those are all transactions. In fact, the very first transaction system was built back in 1966. It was called CICS from IBM. So transaction processing is the foundation of modern computing. Now, what is the blockchain? The blockchain itself is a generic name for the core database and transaction processing capabilities that are built inside of Bitcoin. And there's really three things you have to know about the blockchain. The first is that each record, each each piece of the blockchain is an individual transaction. And if you group a whole bunch of transactions together and you approve them all at once, that is a block of transactions. Now, each block of transactions in Bitcoin is secured by something called a hash. And the hash is a mathematical formula where you put in all the numbers in the block and it comes out with a unique ID. And if you change any number in the block, the result is a different unique ID. And that is evidence of tampering if you try to go back and change history. And that's one of the many ways that the blockchain is designed to resist tampering and fraud. So that's a whole block of transactions. It's secured by a hash. And of course, if you string multiple blocks together, you end up with the blockchain. Now, I said before that what Bitcoin does is not necessarily revolutionary, but how it does it is truly extraordinary. And let me go a little bit into that at a not very technical or not very scientific way. There are three things I think that are special about how the blockchain works. The first is what I call distributed processing or what is called distributed processing, right? And this is very straightforward. I can send you some money or you can send me some money using Bitcoin. That original transaction is copied to many other participants in the network. And each participant in a network attempts to confirm that transaction by solving a random number problem. Whoever solves that problem first confirms that and other transactions in a new block for the blockchain. Uh, and blocks are accepted by what it amounts to majority vote, right? So the most correct blocks, the recent blocks are confirmed. And because the transactions are confirmed using a random number problem, it's almost impossible to engage in collusion. So distributed processing is one of the powerful tools of Bitcoin that are used to make sure that there's a minimum risk of fraud or abuse in the system. The second amazing thing about Bitcoin is the synchronization of records. So uh, every single major node in the Bitcoin network has a copy of all the transaction history. That means that you cannot go back and adjust any one of your own transactions because now your transaction history and all of your hash numbers will show tampering and they will be out of sync with everyone else's. This makes it much harder to find a central location, change records, and change history. It's just not possible. And this is why 
places like uh, con many countries are starting to look at technologies like Bitcoin to replace land registries as a way of fighting corruption. The last thing that Bitcoin does, which is very different from other transaction processing systems, is it allows you not to send just numbers or text, but to actually send what I call smart information, what sometimes is called smart contracts. We can attach rules, which are really little computer programs, to those transactions. So I can pay you a certain amount of money, but that payment is only complete if you do something else for me. Right? Those little pieces of smart information uh, will turn out to be quite useful in really developing whole applications that we can run in the blockchain. And they're crucial, I believe, for fixing a, a long-standing problem with payment, which is how do you connect payment to the delivery of a product or service? Well, if you can confirm the delivery of a product and service, you can actually set up the payment in such a way that it's only triggered upon delivery. So what does this all add up to? What I would argue this adds up to is that Bitcoin may be the single most secure piece of commercial information technology ever developed. Now, that's a really big statement, but I'll tell you why I think it's true for four important reasons. Number one, this technology is unbelievably secure and reliable, and it's incredibly resilient in many different ways to fraud, abuse, and attack. And if we think about the world that we live in today, security and trust are the single most valuable things that we could have on the internet. Secondly, the blockchain is very, very efficient. Now, it's not efficient in a traditional sense in that it uses a lot of compute power. And I'll come back to this later, but compute power, I believe, is something that's essentially free and it's going to be everywhere. And so the blockchain makes use of idle compute power that is already sitting around in the world. The blockchain and Bitcoin are open technologies, and I believe fundamentally that there is no security if a technology is not open source. Someone can tell you that they did all the best practices, but in unless you can inspect the code, unless many people can ins inspect the code, you cannot be sure. It's easy for bad actors, for government entities to insert secret backdoors in closed source code. It's almost impossible to do that deliberately in open source code. Now, that doesn't mean that open source code is completely secure. Bugs happen, accidents happen, but I would argue it's much less likely to be uh, directly manipulated uh, if it's open source. And finally, Bitcoin was designed as a bank. It was designed for payments, and that means it's designed for commerce. And I think it's an amazing foundation for building a digital commerce future. So how can you use Bitcoin? I think there's three big ways in which we'll see Bitcoin being used in the future. First of all, as a bank and a currency, exactly as Bitcoin was designed. And that's very popular, but the design of Bitcoin comes with a lot of political baggage. There are inbuilt views and rules that basically design a system that is fundamentally deflationary uh, and is likely to be relatively volatile. So I think uh, I personally love the technology. I don't keep any assets in Bitcoin. I think it's a very efficient payment system, but I wouldn't necessarily keep a lot of cash in a network. The second way, which I think will be enormously popular for Bitcoin, is Bitcoin as a platform. So for very small amounts of money, we can do tiny, tiny Bitcoin transactions. We can attach information to each one of those transactions. Car ownership records, shipping records, notary records, you name it, we can add that to a transaction. We can even write small applications, uh, smart contracts that go with that. And once those get into the Bitcoin public blockchain, they become part of a permanent, global, widely copied public record. Once you register an asset as yours in that public blockchain, it's gonna be very hard for somebody to steal it and claim that they didn't know it was yours. So I will see a lot of emerging companies using the public Bitcoin blockchain as a mechanism for registering, notarizing, and storing uh, doc documents or pointers to documents. The last way that the blockchain can be used, and I think the one that will be by far the most popular, is the creation of many, many different blockchain platforms. Many people will do, as I did when I was at IBM, which is take the core technology of Bitcoin and remove the, the currency component 
and replace it with uh, any different any different mechanism that you want for payments or storage. We used it for energy credits, trading advertising, there are all kinds of things you can do. And I think we'll see the emergence of thousands of different blockchains. Those blockchains will serve everything from settling stock transactions to paying for uh, energy credits to um, you know storing meter readings or tweets or likes or other distributed computing platforms. A really good example is Ethereum. Ethereum is a blockchain platform that's a fully complete programming language. You can write cloud applications on that platform. So how quickly will we see blockchain platforms arise? I think already we're starting to see early ones. As William Gibson likes to say, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So what do I mean by that? Well, the blockchain is a computationally complex and intensive platform to build. You can't just run it on your average toaster or refrigerator. But the good news is that we're headed towards a world where the average toaster and refrigerator is pretty much as smart as your original iPhone. And the reason that's happening is because it's now becoming cheaper to build a full system on chip, just drop the equivalent of an iPhone or an Android phone in a light bulb or an antenna or a doorknob. It's cheaper to do that than it is to build a customized embedded chip. And we're going to see more and more products like uh, this one example I have from Apple where uh, even simple computer cables have a full computer in them. Right? And the reason for that is it's faster to drop in a full computer with memory and write a piece of software that does the work than it is to create a customized embedded chip. So with the Internet of Things, we're headed towards a world where there's ridiculous amounts of computing power, way more than is needed actually to run your light bulbs or your door smart doorknobs or whatever. It's going to be everywhere. In fact, even if you exclude the Internet of Things, we're already swimming in computing power and storage and bandwidth, right? There are uh, hundreds of times more compute power, 2.2 billion smartphones, nearly a billion PCs. You compare that to the biggest web services companies that have somewhere between five and seven million PCs, they are a rounding error in data centers compared to what's on your desktop or in your pocket. The same thing is true of storage. Uh, there's something like 890,000 terabytes of unused PC storage out there, uh, which is thousands of times more than every major data center storage provider in the world. Right? So we're swimming in storage power, we're swimming in compute power. Until the blockchain came along, we never really had a way to harness this in a secure and scalable way. The blockchain makes it possible to harness all this compute and storage power and to do so securely in a way that's very scalable. Ultimately, I think this leads to what you might call the postmodern era of computing. So in the modern era of computing, the era that my mother grew up in when she was a mainframe software developer, uh, computing was expensive and it was efficient to buy one mainframe and to centralize all the workload to that mainframe, to keep it really busy. But the good news was you operated in a high trust environment. Everybody knew everybody else. My mother actually used to visit the IBM factory and meet the people who were making the mainframes that would be packed up, shipped to her facility, and where she would use them. And so in that modern era of computing, it was centralized, it was trusted, and uh, it was relatively expensive. The postmodern era looks different. In this era, computing power is free, but trust is rare and valuable and expensive. And what that leads us towards is a highly distributed, very resilient and fundamentally secure computing model, one that I believe will be powered by the blockchain. So that's all for my quick explanation. As I said, I don't come to this from a information, I don't come for this from a financial services point of view, I come to it from an internet of things and information technology perspective. And I believe that the blockchain is the platform that we will use to build our computing environments in the future. So please follow me on uh, Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn. I always love to hear from folks who are working on interesting startups or new technology ideas. Thanks very much.